Sometimes I like to start my classes with a quote for the day. So uh, here's one that um, comes from King Solomon from the book of Proverbs in the Bible. It is by his deeds that a young man distinguishes himself. Hmm. You know, I know a lot of people in their oral exams when trying to be a firefighter like to say, well, I want to be a firefighter because I'm service oriented. Guess what? The next question is going to be, can you tell us how you are service oriented? What have you done in the last couple of years to serve your community? Yeah, it's not what you say, it's what you do that really matters. I knew a young man that was an explorer and he was at a, uh, a training session where they were going to do ladders and the uh, explorer leader said, today we're going to learn how to do the one-man 24-foot elevation. Uh, so uh, how, to, how to raise a one-man 24 evolution, not elevation. How to raise a one-man 24-foot ladder. Well, this young guy that I knew, he said to a friend, kind of whispered to him, but not soft enough, I know, I already know how to do that. Well, the leader heard him. And he said, uh, so Evan, since you already know how to do the one man 24, why don't you uh, show us how? Give us an example. And uh, thankfully, he had some proctors that he had be spotters because he almost dropped the ladder. Yeah, don't be boasting. Don't be talking about how awesome you are. Just show people. That's what King Solomon said. And he was a pretty awesome dude. So uh, let's get started with our, our class today. We're going to talk about occupancy types. And it starts with uh, understanding what's a use group. Uh, in fact, use is a term we need to um, understand that um, when we're talking about what are you going to use it for. When you're going to build a building, we want to know what are you going to use it for. So that's the use group. Um, it's the most significant factor that affects the design of a building. It's going to be the first uh, question that's asked. And it's the answer to the question, what are you going to do there? Every uh, set of plans that are turned in, the first uh, page or the first sheet, as they call it, is going to towards the top, tell the inspector or the engineer who reviews those plans what type of occupancy it is. So this should be the first consideration during a plan check and on every inspection we do. What kind of an occupancy type is this? Because the rules change based on the occupancy type. When we know the use, we then can put it in the, the building or portions of the building into an occupancy type. So we put the building or portions of the building into types. And then those occupancy types tell us which rules apply to this building because they're different for different occupancies. So when inspecting, we should always check and always ask ourselves, is this building use consistent with its original occupancy type? Because the use group is going to determine the building height, the area allowed, the type of construction, the built-in fire protection systems, which ones and how big and what kind. The occupant load factors are going to be determined by it. And the whole means of egress uh, system and all of its features are going to be related to what kind of an occupancy is it, how many people are in there. And all of these things are interconnected. As an inspector, whenever you find a building that's been changed from its an, uh, original occupancy type, we need to catch that. And uh, we might find, we'll talk about that a little bit later, but we might find that we need to uh, send a message over to the building official and tell them they need to come out and check out this building. So the first 
of our occupancy types is the assembly group. Uh, a for assembly. So uh, there's five different kinds of assemblies, and uh, we're going to talk about each one, but you need to know that an assembly is defined as a structure, building, or portions thereof used for the gatherings of people for the purposes such as civic, social, religious, recreational functions, the consumption of food or drink, or waiting areas. Now, there is an exception when we're talking about the assembly group that we need to understand. If the building has 49, or the room, has 49 people or less, then it's not an assembly, even though it might fit that definition of, of being for the gathering of people for one of these purposes. So a Starbucks that only holds 40 people is a B. It's a business. And the business uh, occupancy type doesn't have as strict rules as the assembly group type. So once you get to 50 or more occupants, then you are definitely an assembly. If you are less than 50, 49 or less, then you're going to be put in the category of group B. Now this confuses a lot of people. We'll talk about it a little bit more as we talk about restaurants and as we talk about businesses, but just uh, for Right now, know that 50 or more assembly, 49 or less, B. Now, these other two things here on the bottom of the uh, slide, those are just two different ways of saying it. Um, if the space fits 50 people, or if the face is 750 square feet or less, then it's B. If it's more, then it's A. So... All of that is the equivalent of saying 50 occupants or more. Our first kind of assembly group is A1. And the A1 is performing arts or motion pictures, and it's usually fixed seating, but sometimes it isn't. So concert halls, theaters, motion picture stu uh, theaters, TV and radio studios, but only those where they admit an audience, of 50 or more. So our picture shows College of the Canyons Performing Arts Center. Now before we go on I want to tell you that there's a um, kind of an unwritten rule and it isn't a hundred percent consistent but whenever any of the occupancy types have more than one kind so like assemblies have A1s, A2s, A3s, A4s, A5s then usually the first one is the most hazardous or the one we're most concerned about. The last one is the least hazardous. Now that isn't a hundred percent across the board. There are a few exceptions to that, but for the most part, motion picture theaters, concert halls, they hold a lot of people and it's a little bit too difficult to get out and some of our worst disasters have been in theaters like this, like the Iroquois Theater Fire that we talked about. Assembly Group 2, or A2, is any place that is used for food and or drink consumption, like banquet halls, nightclubs, restaurants, taverns, and bars. And you can hear it in the background, the music going, you know, everybody's dancing, they're waving their little glow sticks in the air, and they're at a nightclub or a rave. These are A2s, okay? And in an A2, we have a lot of concerns because we're cooking food, we're serving food, some, uh, sometimes we're sitting at tables, sometimes like in a nightclub, there might be standing room only. Um, but an A2 is nightclubs, restaurants, taverns and bars, banquet halls, and it is an area where we're very concerned about the amount of people that are in it. This is one of the most common violators of their occupancy load, the amount of people that we tell them that they can't get any more than that amount in there. 
They want to make as much money as they can, so they let in as many people as they can. So this is a big concern, and that was a concern at the Station Fire, the Kiss Nightclub, the Lame Horse Nightclub, all, all the disasters we've talked about in nightclubs, they were all overcrowded. All of them. A3 is a, a big category with uh, just a huge amount of, of uh, types of places that are in it. So it's kind of a trash, what we call a trash can category, where it doesn't fit in A1, A2, A4, or A5, so it must be an A3. So art galleries, exhi exhibition halls, amusement arcades, bowling alleys, churches, courtrooms, lecture halls, libraries, Indoor, now this is an important one to understand, indoor sports areas where there's no spectators. So your gym is an A3 if there's 50 or more people. Uh, if you are at, well, let's look at the next slide. If you're at your gym at your old high school where they have bleachers that they can pull out for the basketball and volleyball games, and maybe even badminton or something like that. Really exciting. Um, <laughs> indoor sporting events that have spectators, then that's an A4. So no spectators, but a sport like, like a skating rink that's only used for practice, but not for games and, and viewing with spectators. That's an A3. My daughter goes to a place called Hugo Gymnastics. She does her gymnastics there. There is a little bit of a spectator area, but it's very small. It's just for the parents to uh, keep an eye on the kids. Um, that would probably be an A3, depending on the occupancy load. But A4 is where we have spectators at sporting events. Now, you might be wondering, oh, okay, well, the Staples Center. Well, guess what? The Staples Center also has concerts. So whatever is the most, uh, has the, the highest requirements and we consider the ha most hazardous, we're going to go with that. So at the Staples Center, it's an A1 and an A4, so we're going to build it as an A1. Assembly Group A5 is... Uh, spectator uh, sports and viewing outdoor areas that are outdoors. So amar amusement park structures, bleachers, grandstands, and the Coliseum there uh, at a great USC game. Uh, those are all uh, A5. Well, let's move on to B. But again, we're going to clarify this little difference. Now, if an occupancy meets the definitions of a B, then it doesn't matter how many people are there. You need to understand that. If it meets the definition of an A and there's 49 or less, then it's a B. If it's 50 or more, then it's an A. So an in and out, a smaller one, that doesn't have 50 or more people, it's going to be just a B. But an in and out that serves 55 people, it's an A. So this is, uh, you know, something that we need to keep in mind. What's the occupancy load? One of the ways you can tell if it's an A or a B when you're in an in and out or a Starbucks, do they have the occupant load posted on the wall? If they have 50 or more, then they are considered an A, and by law, by code, they are required to put the occupant load on a sign on a wall uh, where it's very visible. So here's the definition of Group B. An office, professional, or service type facility where they do service type transactions. So look at this big long list. Barber shops, dry cleaning, post offices, professional services, uh, clinics, radio TV stations that don't have spectators, um, and educational occupancies above the 12th grade 
with 49 or less people. So if you uh, are taking a class at Oxnard Community College and you're in room 111, that room only holds about 40 some odd people. That's its occupant load. It's a B because we're past 12th grade, we're in college, but we're under 50 people. But if you go over to the computer room, the computer room allows for more than 50. That room is an A. The rest of the building is all B because it's just an off set of offices and classrooms that don't hold 50 or more people. Um, I want you to also notice uh, motor vehicle showrooms. That's a B. Things having to do with motor vehicles, just because there's motor vehicles there doesn't mean it's going to be uh, high hazard because they're uh, only if it's... Um, you know, has high hazard things. So just because there's cars there doesn't mean it's going to be one of our higher risk items. So if it's a motor vehicle showroom, it's a B. If it's a car wash, it's a B. Now, if they're repairing cars, it's going to be different. If they're filling it with gas, it's going to be different. Then there's the E group, educational group E. And it's used for educational purposes by six or more over two years of age, because if they're under two years of age, they're not, um, very important word here, they're not ambulatory. We're going to talk about that word when we talk about institutions. But if they aren't ambulatory, they are uh, going to be in an institution type category. But two years of age through the 12th grade, over two years of age, not two years of age, over two years of age through the 12th grade is considered an E. Now some daycares can fit in this category like after school daycare. Um, but any education supervision or personal care that um, is not with people uh, that can, uh, if, if people can't self-evacuate, in other words if they're handicapped, if they are infants, if they are senior citizens, then they don't fit in this category. It's only uh, people who can self-evacuate, and there's more than, more than five, six or more, older than two years old, then, and they are meeting for the purpose of education. Then it's going to be an E. Now, once we get past 12th grade, then it's either going to be a B or an A, depending on the size of the room and how many people it allows for. So at college or training in an office building, the office building might all be B, but if they have a training room that holds 75 people, then that part of the building will be considered A. And the rest of the office building will be considered B. Now, how about uh, at churches? Well, that's not considered E. And look at that exception, religious educational rooms accessory to a church with an occupant load of less than 100, they're A3s as long as they're not less than 50. Um, so Sunday school rooms are basically uh, A3s. Sunday school rooms are going to be A3s. Now the uh, factory group and uh, the factory group Ha assembles, disassembles, fabricates, finishes, manufactures, does packaging, repair or processing operations, any of that, but is not H, high hazard, or S, storage. Then it's factory group. So if you're making it, if you're uh, putting it together, dis uh, taking it apart, fabricating it, finishing it, all of that, is factory group and there's two categories F1 and F2. In F1 this is the more higher hazard one um, aircraft appliances automobiles bakeries beverages with more than 12 percent alcohol boats brooms or brushes clothing dry cleaning plants um, what's mill work? Mill work is uh, where they're uh, uh, 
they've got metal on a lathe or something like that where they're milling things. So this is all considered F1. Here's some more. Uh, also an F1 category. If you're making um, in the picture cabinets, uh, there's a lot of dust with making cabinets. And of course, the cabinets themselves are very flammable. Photographic film. Film is very, very flammable. Printing and publishing. Flammable. Plastics. Very flammable. Refuse incineration. All of these things are F1s because they're a little bit more vulnerable to fire. Now, textiles. What's textiles? Uh, I see that hand. One of you is raising your hand. Um, it's clothing. So making clothing is textiles. In F2, it's a lower hazard. Now, it might be something like a foundry, uh, like in the picture where they're, they've got a lot of heat, but it's not highly flammable. Um, we used to have in my old district a, a brick factory, uh, Castaic Brick, and uh, it's hotter than blazes in there. We did have a fire one time in the foundry, uh, in the brick foundry, and um, and it wasn't a bad fire, but man, I went inside to check with the guys, and I was in there one minute and said, okay, I'm going back out to the engine. It was hotter than blazes in there, but it's not really that flammable. Masonry products aren't that flammable, only the dusty parts. So uh, ceramic, glass products, gypsum, that's uh, drywall, ice, metal products, these are all low hazards in the manufacturing uh uh, area of types of buildings. Now, the high hazard group, that's kind of related to both factory and storage, but we're dealing with hazardous materials. Now, this is a complicated thing, and we're not going to get really deep into it, but uh, how do we know if it's a high hazard? Well, it's based on the amount of products. So, manufacturing, processing, generating, or storing all of the materials that might be in a factory or in a storage area, but we have quantities of high uh, physical or health hazards that exceed the numbers in Table 307.71. Uh, and actually, I'm not even sure it's still called that based on the changes in the International Code. But um, there's a table, I believe it's in... Uh, chapter 34 or something like that, 37. Um, I haven't looked at it in a long time, but they tell you, so if you have this much of this flammable material, then it's an H. You're considered a high hazard group. So there are exceptions, and they also allow for control areas. If you have this bad stuff, this methyl ethyl bad stuff, but you put it in a control area, then maybe you can have more, like a flammable materials cabinet. Um, and, and then it'll say how many cabinets you can have and still be not considered high hazard. Because most facilities don't want to be a high hazard category because they have stricter rules and they get inspected more often and they have to pay for permits. So it's a dollar and cents thing, and uh, but Hey, if they meet the, the quantities, we're going to put them in the high hazard group. So there's five different kinds. The first one is H1, and that's for explosives. And uh, yes, that building holds explosives. I know it doesn't look like much, but in uh, when they're storing explosives, they use buildings oftentimes that will fall right down. Now, uh, the um, arsenals for the the military they usually put them in um what do they call those bunkers in deep concrete and stuff like that so that they can't uh be bombed easily or or attacked easily but this is where they're either manufacturing or storing some uh fireworks they they want it to fall down there there's one of these in my uh uh, um, near my home, <laughs> actually not too close, but uh, in Canyon Country, and it looks just like this. 
and they've got all the signs around, you know, they don't want people knowing it's explosives in there, but they say no smoking, keep out, and all that kind of stuff, and they have an NFPA diamond of 444, and, uh, and a W that's crossed out, and stuff like that. So, uh, explosives, organic peroxides like ANFO, class 4 oxidizers, pyrophoric material, anything that's unstable like uh, uh, picric acid, you know, so that would be H1. Now, we're going to skip H2, but it's flammable materials, flammable and combustible materials. H3 is uh, products that readily support combustion like oxidizers. Um, oxidizers add to the fire and make it worse. H4 is health hazards. These are things that eat you or, uh, or if you breathe it, kill you. So acids, corrosives, um, anything that's highly toxic, uh, uh, pesticides and herbicides that if you breathe them or get them on you that can kill you. Um, these are health hazards. And they're put in a blue cabinet and in fact, if it's an acid, it's a blue wood cabinet, not a metal cabinet, because the acid will eat the wood. Our last high uh, hazard group is H5. Now, th this is for semiconductor fabrication facilities. So semiconductors uh, are use, they use a lot of different hazardous chemicals to make them. And in these facilities, they consider them to be a high hazard. Uh, and these these kind of facilities, they've got clean rooms, and and they they have a lot of stuff that's really touchy. So they gave them their own category, but it's the least of the worst. <laughs> so H is your worst category, your most hazardous, but H five is the least of the worst. Then there's the institutional group. Now, this is what I was talking about earlier. The institutional group is for anyone that can't self-evacuate. So it's for the care or supervision of people having physical limitations due to health or age are harbored for medical treatment or other care or treatment. And... So people who can't evacuate, or look at uh, bullet point one, people who we won't let evacuate, in which occupants are detained for penal or correctional purposes, or for those that are uh, mentally ill, where we might uh, restrict their liberty. So their, their liberties are restricted because of criminal activity, or because of mental problems, so as well as the health problems. These are people who cannot self-evacuate. That's kind of the, um, the, the definition of non-ambulatory. Non-ambulatory are people who cannot evacuate without help. So there's three categories of institutional, and I have yet to figure out why they consider this number one. So this is one of those exceptions to the rule that I told you earlier. Residential board and care facilities, assisted living facilities, halfway houses like uh, uh, passages down in Malibu uh, and places like that where the rich go to get undrunk, um, congregate care facilities, social rehab, alcohol and drug centers. Uh, there's a few exceptions to those if it's 6 to 16 uh, it can be classified as R4, five or fewer people, but the, uh, classified as R3. The, I just don't see why this is category one. This is probably the least dangerous of the three in the category, but that's where they put it. Uh, I'm not the boss of that. I2 is hospitals, nursing homes, mental hospitals, um, medical, surgical, psychiatric, nursing, custodial care facilities for over five who are not capable of self-preservation. So these are I-2s. Child care on a 24-hour basis for more than five children under age two and a half years of age would also be considered an I-2. So your local hospital, your uh, 
surgical care, sometimes it, it depends. If they incapacitate people, it's an I2. Um, so, you know, that's where it's kind of a little sketchy sometimes on uh, uh, whether it's just a, a doctor's office or if it's an I2. A doctor's office would be a B. But if they're incapacitating people, then it's an I2. I3 is prisons, jails, reformatories, detention centers, correctional facilities. Um, this is NCCF. I used to uh, inspect this facility and all of the Pitches Detention Center. Uh, it took me a whole month to uh, inspect Pitches Detention Center because there are four or five parts to it. Uh, it's changed over the years. Uh, there used to be five parts. Now there's four parts. Um, the, this is a place where people are restrained because we don't allow them to, to uh you know, self-evacuate or move around. Now, uh, you don't want to be in one of these places. Uh, I had to go there as an inspector. I just want to tell you, they stink. It smells so bad in there because you got all of these people, whether it's men or women, depending on it's men or women's prisons, they're both the same though, and they don't all bathe and they just stink and it smells like, oh, I don't even want to tell you. It smells really bad really bad so there are some conditions um, basically it has to do with if the movement is restricted it's an I3 okay so you can read through all of those but basically they're all diff five different ways of saying uh, slightly differently the same thing if they're restricted then it's an I3 now, there is actually a fourth group. Did I say there's three? There used to be. Um, but there's a fourth group. And this is what I was talking about earlier, that sometimes daycares are I-4s and sometimes they're E's. If it's an after-school daycare um, with older kids, that's an E. But if, if they are uh, uh, younger, under two and a half years of age, it's going to be an I-4. Infants can't self-evacuate. And if they are uh, adult daycare, that's a big thing now. Um, if they are, are not capable of self-preservation, then they're an I-4. If they are capable of self-preservation, they're just coming together to play bingo and hang out, then it's an A-3. Um, so, daycare facilities where people are, uh, where they're children that are very young or the very old and they can't get out on their own, we're going to call it an I-4. Oh, well, we're almost done here. We're getting uh, halfway through the alphabet and there really aren't that many more, but there's Mercantile Group M. And that's a pretty easy one. Display and sale of merchandise involving stocks of goods accessible to the public. So BevMo, Best Buy, uh, Home Depot, Lowe's, Walmart, Costco. These are all M's. Retail or wholesale. Uh, sales room and their storerooms. Drug stores. CVS. All of those kind of places. Now, there are two kinds of R's that concern us. We're not going to inspect R3s, but there are more than one kind of R. There's actually at least four um, that I know of. But the ones that concern us the most are R1s and R2s. Um, R1s are... Uh, now, why is this... Uh, well, I'll bring that up in a second. Um, R1s are hotels, boarding houses, and motels. Now, this picture is where I went when I won a trip on Wheel of Fortune. So that's in Jamaica, man. And uh, that's Sandals uh, White, White, White House Resort or something like that. Uh, and I was in one of the buildings over to the far left. It was beautiful. The water is that gorgeous. But it was hot. It was really hot. Even the water was hot. But it was a lot of fun. We had a great time. Um, but notice that this is the more risky one of the two. And the reason is they're primarily transient in nature. So when you go to a hotel, you really don't know your way around. That's why I always say check out the exit uh, 
diagram by your door. Make sure you know the way out of your hotel. Our twos are dwell uh, more than two dwelling units per building, but they're permanent. So apartments, convents, dormitories, frat houses, hotels and motels that are not transient. So maybe it's, um, oh, what do they call that? Uh, extended stay hotels, uh, something like that. They might cat categorize it as an R2, but if people are staying there for shorter periods of time, a a less than a month, then it's an R1. Now, R3s, we don't inspect except for when they're being built. So um, not more than two dwelling units per building that's not classified as an R1, R2, or R4. Um, basically, these are homes. Uh, this is my dream home in Kauai. That's where I, boy, wouldn't it be wonderful to have a beautiful deck looking out at the ocean? And I like that house. I want to live there. So uh, maybe maybe uh, someday uh, I'll win the lotto, but I never play. So uh, <laughs> I can't afford to live in Kauai, but I'd love to. Um, there are uh, that R4 group for adult and uh, child daycare that's um, not not more than five occupants. Actually, you can have daycare up to, I think it's 14 in the home and it's R4, but we're not going to get into that. Okay, one of our last categories here, storage. Storage group, there's two categories, S1 and S2s. Basically, not 100%, but if you made it in an F1, you store it in an S1. If you made it in an F2, you're probably going to store it in an S2. So S1s are places that store aerosols, um, aircraft repair hangers, bags, burlap, uh, things that are fl more flammable, books, boots, clothing, furniture, uh, plastics. Motor vehicle repair garages, as long as they don't exceed the maximum quantity of hazardous materials, which would make them an H, then they're an S1. So we fill up the car with gas at an M. We buy the car at a B. We take it to get repaired at an S1. We park it in an open parking garage, that's an S2. So cars can end up all over the place. S2s are aircraft hangers. Now, we made the aircraft in an F1. We repair it in an S1, but they store them. They consider aircraft hangers S2s. It's one of the exceptions to what I was saying. Um, beverages up to 12% alcohol or S2, more than 12% alcohol, S1. Uh, cement, uh, dairy products dry cell batteries, empty cans. You might think that's silly. I was in a warehouse once on an inspection that had just rows and rows of pallets full of cans. And I, I said, is this all Coke? And he goes, no, these are empty cans for Coke. And they were literally just stacked and stacked and stacked on top of each other. And I asked the guy, what happens if you bump into one of these? And he goes, oh, you don't want to know. It's a mess. Once one falls over, they all fall over and they collapse on themselves. But uh, I thought it was pretty interesting just to see this huge warehouse full of empty cans. S2 also includes your storage unit where you got. Now, <laughs> that's one of those things like... Uh, I always say that one of the most dangerous vehicles on the road is Federal Express and UPS because they can have small quantity hazardous materials that uh, don't exceed the quantities requiring placarding. And it's the same with your storage unit. These storage units, you're, you're told not to put anything hazardous in it, but heaven knows. They found storage units where people were murderers were hiding bodies and they find storage units that have been used for making crystal meth and stuff like that so uh but they are considered an s2 
Um, so things like meats, mirrors, porcelain stoves, washers and dryers. And also, as I mentioned before, parking garages, open and enclosed, uh, those are considered S2. Well, our last group is U, and it stands for utilities, but I think it's the big trash can. This is the, the group that if it didn't fit anything else, we're just going to call it a U. So accessory and miscellaneous structures not classified anywhere else. So agriculture buildings, aircraft hangars um, that are part of someone's home. So, uh, yeah, the really rich people, they have their own, they fly in and then they cruise up and park in their little like, hangar and then walk out and get in their house. Uh, yeah, just the really rich. Barns, carports, even fences over six feet high, grain silos uh, that are part of a residence, greenhouses, uh, that's kind of pretty, isn't it? Livestock shelters, private garages, all of those are used. Now, what about mixed-use buildings? Well, we're going to construct the building to the most stringent requirements. So if we have a restaurant in a strip mall with an insurance office, a barber shop, a tanning salon, and a little Circle K at the other end, we're going to build it to the requirements of the restaurant, which is an A2, because it's the most stringent. Um, we're, we should, uh, when there's mixed-use buildings, oftentimes we're going to put in firewalls and we're going to create a separation between the portions of the buildings. So here's a typical example of a firewall separating two different kinds of occupancy type, but it's one building. There's also a special use category. The special use category um, is... A, a, Places like high-rise buildings, covered malls, amusement buildings, uh, places where we're going to require all of the same things as their common use group, but we're also going to provide higher levels of protection. So high-rise buildings are all um, uh, type 1 construction. They're all going to have the strictest fire protection equipment because it's a higher risk place. Now, what about when there's going to be a change in the building? We've been using it for storage. It's a warehouse. Now it's going to be used for a nightclub and for raves. Well, that's a change. So now the structure has to meet the requirements for the new use. So in most jurisdictions, they've got to go through the whole building permit process again, and they might have to change some things in the building. Usually, it's they're going to um, add more fire protection or add more stability to the building. There are times where they actually will say, no, you can't use this building for what you want to use it for. So uh, they might have to go through a whole other plan check. It's our job to catch people. Now, because that costs a lot of money, a lot of people will just change the, the use and they won't go through that process. So we visit once a year. So we're going to be the ones that catch them with their pants down, uh, making changes like that. And uh, we will let the building official know and get them to uh, take care of, of the problem. So in summary, the use group is most significant step in the design of the building. It's going to determine the type, the height, the area, the fire protection, and the means of egress requirements. It's going to, or it is up to us as firefighters to catch any illegal changes in use and to notify the building official. Remember, there are some special use types of places and their requirements are going to be over and above what the use group requirements are. Uh, and buildings with multiple use are called mixed-use buildings. Mixed-use buildings might construct 
or we will construct to the most stringent requirements, but we might add firewalls, create separation between buildings, and or fire separation areas. So now, if you want to do the extra credit, you can keep on going here. If you don't, you're done, and you can turn this off. But the extra credit's pretty easy. Um, you should have printed out the, uh, the little questionnaire. And um, so what type of occupancy is this? If you get the uh, letter and the number, then uh, you, you get a better grade. If you just get the letter, though, that's good. You'll get a point. What type of occupancy is this? It's got a letter and a number. What type of occupancy is this one? Hmm, Home Depot. I even used that as an example. Of course, you can pause this if you want while you think about it. Yeah, it's a ray. Look how it's all blurry and, 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 and there's double exposures. That's, that's how most of the people there at that rave see things. <laughs> okay, what type of occupancy is it? Oh, this one has less than 50 people. And they're singing Kumbaya. And look at that lady. She's really into it. She's loving the music so much she's standing up. Next thing you know, there's going to be a mosh pit there in the front. Now, I want you to notice in the far distance, there's bleachers. Do you see the bleachers? And there's people in the bleachers. So there's spectators. What type of occupancy is this? It's got a letter and a number. Mm, this is the Hyatt in Valencia, California, a six-story multi-room hotel. What kind of occupancy type is it? It's got a letter and a number. Ooh, an outdoor swim stadium. Uh, it's kind of been hot up here where I live the last couple of days. This, this looks good. I, I want to go there and jump in the pool. What type of occupancy is it? It's a letter and a number. A motor vehicle showroom. Mmm, we talked about that. Henry Mayo Hospital. Letter and a number. Pitches Detention Center. You don't want to go there. This is the North facility. It's a nasty, nasty place that smells horrible. I went here after there was a riot once, and I was working on a guy that had 70 stab wounds. 70. Second to the last one. What type of occupancy is it? Letter and a number. Last one. We don't know what this is, so just give me the letter. You don't have to give me the number. What letter would a large chemical facility be? Okay, that's all, folks. Uh, upload your answers if you want that extra credit, and, and I'll grade those as soon as I have time. And uh, thanks for your patience. Sorry if this was, uh, I'd hope to make this a little shorter, but, you know, I tell some stories and I get carried away. Have a great day.